so, uh, and the state of those contracts that they change, they typically involve some amount of currency. That's what makes smart contracts so relevant for today, for the actually stateful object that manage some real coins. And uh, as objects, they have one or more entry points, so there are, which means there's more than one way typically to interact with them. And Handman has already uh, went through the main usages of smart contracts, such as crowdfunding, multi-party accounting, voting, which might or might not be a good idea, given that typically on the blockchain everything is public, puzzle solving games, and distribution of rewards. And by now there is, well, okay, so the pioneers were the Ethereum, by now there is a bunch of platforms, including ourselves, Zilliqa, who support uh, one or another form of smart contracts with different expressivity and different guarantees. So, uh, Ethereum-style smart contracts, which is how we usually think of smart contracts, they turn out to combine together four essentially disjoint traits. Uh, first, they perform computations. Just like regular programs, they obtain results from some given inputs. They also perform state manipulations, like, like programs in the languages that we all know and love, like C or Java or C Sharp. They change the contract state represented by the contract fields. There are also some effects that do not fall into this category. So contracts, they might transfer money to other contracts and to other parties, and they also might emit what's called events to notify the clients of the blockchain that something interesting is happening. So this is not exactly the manipulation with the state of the contract. So this is what we call the effect. And what's most important, the contracts, they communicate <coughs> with each other. In an Ethereum, the contracts usually communicate by just making calls to each other as to different objects, well, we can probably represent it differently in a more principled way. So the, way, the main purpose of communicating between the contracts is to exchange data and to exchange funds. Okay, so this is an important slide. By the way, all this stuff will be shared online, so there's no, no need to take pictures. And uh, in the initial proposal on Ethereum smart contracts, these four aspects were sort of entangled like that. And, well, there are many wrong things with having it like that because this is what makes contracts very difficult to reason about. So you never know whether a certain call actually corresponds to just calling a function or it corresponds to transferring the funds. And indeed, this is what makes this contract very interesting to build tools for. And that's actually a very, very fruitful area and an active research. But if we want to get something off the ground that is safe by design, that's probably not such a great idea to have that much expressivity. So with this in mind, we decided to design our own programming language, which is um, usually advised against, but we hope that in our case it will pay off. And in this uh, programming language design, we made certain choices towards actually reducing the expressivity while still remaining a reasonably expressive program, programming language to write smart contracts in. And the idea of Scylla was to uh, structure these four aspects in the following way. So the computations, they would be at the core of everything. So first of all, the contract is a program that computes certain values. But those computations would be at the level of program very distinguished, very much disting uh, distinguishable from the state manipulations and the effects that happen syntactically in a different category. And finally, on top of all of that, the contracts would communicate with each other. So the communication, it would be disjoint from state manipulation and effects and computations. So this is how Scylla came to be, and Scylla, uh, actually it's a region in Italy and also a plant apparently, but the name has been chosen to indicate a smart contract intermediate level language, and also Scylla with white has been already taken by a Greek monster. Uh, so these are the main points in the design of Scylla. So we have taken uh, a very minimalistic and principal model of computation, which some of you might have seen if you have any uh, experience with functional programming languages such as Haskell, or Camel, and Scala, and Erlang. Uh, anyone in the audience has experience with those? Please raise your hands. Oh, okay. Some of you. Well, those who are not in the Stella team. Uh, okay. So uh, System F is a formalism that has been developed and known for 40 years that essentially had the foundations of mainstream functional programming languages such as Haskell and OCaml and others. So this is the formalism that sort of gives a mathematical model that makes it very, very easy to reason about big classes of programs and ensure that they are correct 
in a certain sense by design. And we'll get to that. So this is actually at the heart of civil. This is the main decision that we decided to adopt. Which again, from the programming language perspective, it's not new. So there are industry, industrial languages that have it, just not in the smart contract space. Some more drastic decision that we decided to take is to get rid of the general recursion and while loops. So in Ethereum, Solidity has while loops and it also has recursion. So any function can call itself and can call any other function in a restricted way. So in one, in some sense, this is fine because eventually the contract, the worst thing that can happen, the contract will run out of gas. Well, but that is something that makes it very, very difficult to reason about the complexity of the contract in terms of how much gas, how many resources, how many computational resources that contract would consume. So we wanted to see if we can actually reduce the expressivity by means of getting rid of the recursion whatsoever and replacing it by a certain mechanism that would be just enough to implement most of the patterns that the programmers usually use loops and recursion for. And essentially what we did, we only left the iteration in the language. And this is the iteration that in Java you could imagine by means of a for loop, except it's slightly more expressive here, and it's implemented by means of what's called the structure recursion. So structure recursion is a way to write recursive programs that are provably terminating. And we'll get to that. So we give the programmer certain primitives to write the programs that are recursive, yet they are probably terminating, and it can be statically determined how much resource, how much gas they would consume. So the effects are explicit. So the expressions that part in the system F and also the recursion, that only happens in the fragment that does not modify a state. In other words, you cannot have a loop that would, in a loop, change the state of your contract, which might be counterintuitive, because this is how we are taught to program with loops, right? So the first lecture on your favorite programming language, which in my case, many years ago, was basic, was saying, uh, well, you need to write a loop, and at each iteration, the loop does something useful by changing the state. Well, that's not going to happen here. So loops, they might, uh, so uh, the loops, they're implemented by means of structure recursion, but they do not modify the state. So if you do not need to modify the state, you do it at the very end. If it sounds odd, it's actually not, and uh, all of the contracts from the first slide, ICOs, games, they actually can be written without the loops that change the state. Finally, there is a communication. So the only way for the contract to interact with other entities, such as the clients of the blockchain, or the other contracts, is to send messages or emit the events. So if the contract wants to call another contract, it can only do that after it has finished its own execution by sending the message, which can be emitted at any point, but only will be sent at the end. So these are the four main pillars of Scylla, which obviously without any code or any example doesn't look that self-explanatory. So essentially the rest of this workshop is going to be dedicated to uh, showing what it's like to write programs in Scylla. So uh, before we actually get into that, so here are some pragmatics. So uh, there's a small team, a uh, small core team in Zilliqa working on Scylla essentially. Uh, four people, and it's all open solo with many, obviously, with many contributions from the rest of the team and also the very active Silica community. So this is all that can be found online uh, in, on GitHub. So as I said, this still as a language is very minimalistic, so it's essentially trying to find the balance between how painful is it to write something useful in the language and also how easy is it to support the static reasoning. Uh, about the safety of this contract. So this is actually a very fundamental trade-off. More expressive your language is, harder is to ensure certain guarantees at the compile time or statically. And we actually had to strike certain compromise, which might uh, or might not be good in certain sense. So uh, still itself is implemented in OCaml, and in fact very much inspired by OCaml as a programming language. So OCaml is an industrial strength, uh, strength uh, functional programming language that is used by many fintech companies such as uh, Standard Chartered, such as Chain Street Capital. And uh, it is actually a very nice programming language to program in. And the testament to that is still implementation, while it actually does a lot of stuff, it's not that big. It's only 6,000, at, at the moment of making the slide, which was a couple of weeks ago, it was 6,000 uh, lines of code. So the core part of it, the evaluator, what actually the blockchain uses in order to execute the contracts, that's what we call the reference interpreter, reference evaluator. It's quite minimalistic. It's less than the, than 400 lines of code, but it uses some advanced OCaml features. So you can try to read it. You will 
probably find that it's very declarative. So mostly the code is purely functional. Uh, it's statically typed, so we obviously test it extensively, but there are surprisingly few, surprisingly few bugs were discovered uh, during doing that. And the language itself is very much inspired by Ocamel, Haskell, Scala, and Erlang, which are all functional languages with certain degree of support for mutable state. So the key point in designing Scylla is making it statically typed. So types are the key of the language design. And most of you who have experience with writing programs probably one at some point wrote type annotations. In some languages you are mandated to write type annotations. In some uh, languages like Python you might omit them and you only put them as the way to document or to catch extra bugs. So in Scylla you <coughs> must write type annotations and essentially the code in some way follows the type. Because types serve not only the way to give the specification, they also serve as a way to ensure certain by design correctness of the program. So types came to be, types as we are going to use them, came to be uh, with uh, the work of Haskell Curry, a very famous American uh, computer scientist and mathematician, who uh, proposed the idea that types, they uh, actually describe sets of not just values in the programs uh, in the languages like C and Java, where we have ints, we have strings, and well, we might have classes. Well, types, there are more than that. They actually should describe programs themselves. So, and if your program is essentially an expression or a function, then you can give a type to this whole program. So unfortunately, like in languages like we mostly program in, like Java programs don't have types. So individual values have types. In Scylla, the whole programs do have types. And that actually gives very, very nice implications uh, for the language itself. Specifically, this gentleman, Robin Milner, who is responsible for maybe 20% of the good ideas in the modern programming languages, uh, he came up with this very simple motto that, in fact, is very theoretically deep. And the motto says that well-typed programs do not go wrong. So what does it mean? It means that if you can assign a type to your program, that means the program is free by design from the certain class of bug. <coughs> so this is why uh, certain <coughs> languages are so nice and easy to pick up and start programming, like Python, because Python actually doesn't impose that. So in Python, your programs run, but then it's on your own risk, so it might crash. And Python is a pleasant language to write in, but if you actually want to have something correct that is correctness critical, like your smart contract that manages money, then probably you want to have stronger guarantees. And of course, there might be bugs even in typed programs, but certain bugs are avoided by design, such as, well, for example, you cannot apply a value of, value, uh, of the type int as a function to string. So in Python or JavaScript, that only will be discovered at runtime, times, so that you are trying to apply something unapplicable where it was not meant to be applied. In statically typed languages, that error will, not, will be caught at the moment of deployment. So it won't be happening as you have already deployed the contract, as we know from Hanlan Stock, cannot be fixed or amended. So once it's on the blockchain, it's there for good. So uh, we cannot add, uh, we cannot manipulate with the values that are sort of incompatible. For example, we cannot take a sum of a list of values and a boolean, because they just belong to different realms. And again, types double. So, and we cannot have mishandled forgotten arguments. So, if our function has three arguments, we cannot apply it uh, to two because, again, that will be called statically. And there are no, and there are actually more specific disciplines. So, what uh, one discipline that we use types in Scylla for? And again, this is something that enforced at the time you write the program, rather when the program is deployed and executed, is that uh, all the values that the program emits they are sort of well represented on the blockchain, so they can be stored. So the program itself can manipulate with many values, not of which can have a representation that can be replicated across the blockchain. So for example, functions cannot be stored in the blockchain, but messages and integers and other simple types they can, and the type system ensures that. So the um, best way to uh, follow this is look at the code, but I realize that, uh, okay, so this is a GitHub repo. Uh, which you are welcome to find, but it might not be that easy to, I mean, assuming that you have compiled Scylla before coming to this lecture, which is unlikely, you might be able to execute the code from this demo, otherwise you just follow my presentation and feel free to jump at any moment uh, to ask questions, uh, because I realize some, some of the concepts might be new and might be not very familiar. <coughs> so, uh, in any event, so this GitHub repository it has all the code 
that I'm going to show, and also it's going to have some exercises for you to try to write your first contract on Scylla at home when you have time. All right, so um, actually before I show the code, um, let me show the types. So Scylla actually is better be, to be explained not from the perspective of programs first, but from the perspective of types. So what are the types that the programs or the values in Scylla might have? They might be primitive types, they might be algebraic data types, and we'll see the examples of those. They might be functions. So uh, lambdas had been introduced in Java 8, but before then there was no lambda type. And in Scylla we have lambdas and the lambda types from the very beginning. So as a value in the language, we have functions that take an argument of a certain type and return a result of a certain possibly different type. So we also have what's called uh, type variables and polymorphic types. So this is something that might be familiar for those who have experience in Java or C++ programming, and they are vaguely reminiscent to Java generics or C++ templates. So this is the way to write generic reusable libraries that are applicable to multiple types. And for all uh, AT, that is a type of a computation or a type of an expression. I wonder where this, where this sounds come, comes from. Um, that's the type of a computer. Yeah, probably should be stop using that. I know actually, it, it, it is the later pointer, which is considered to be a bad taste to use, and the sound gently reminds me that I shouldn't be abusing that too much. And anyway, so uh, what you see in the, at the end is called the polymorphic type, and this is uh, the mechanism to do generics in Scylla. And finally, as an inevitable evil, we have to have separate type, type for maps. Which, are, which you can think of as resizable arrays. So uh, one of the paramount usages of smart contracts is to write certain accounting uh, procedures where you need to keep track of multiple parties giving money or performing certain activity, and the most convenient way to do that is to use the associative <coughs> array that is a map. So we have a type of maps. So uh, let's see what are these types and what are the values that populate these types. So, uh, and for that, uh, I have this file. I hope the font is large enough. If not, I can amplify it. So currently, it's all commented, and each and at the header of it. So if you uh, clone this repository, it's in still a demo slash expressions slash zero one dash values. So that's that's the very first one. All right. So uh, here it shows a number of uh, types and a number of expressions that there might be in Scylla. So the first one. So the first family of expressions are the primitive integer values. So again, Scylla is a language that is designed to please both the analyzers that statically prove the safety of the programs and the programmers. And that's why some of the programs that you write in it, they might look somewhat verbose. So when you want to have the zero, you actually need to specify which zero it is. Because the way you can encode uh, an integer in a programming language, uh, you can encode it by means of a uh, 32-bit integer, 64-bit integer, and whatnot, and a high-level language like Okama or Java, it would basically assign certain type and then we'll do runtime coercion, and since we do not aim for that much expressivity, this is something that you will have to think about up front. So uh, this is the zero that is encoded as the 32-bit integer, and this is the single Scylla program. There is no even contract here, so this is a program that sort of lives outside of the contract. You cannot deploy it to the blockchain but you can already play with it. So still it comes with the evaluator. So uh, when you compile it, there, is little, there will be this function of our runner. And with that, you can evaluate uh, files with expressions. So currently we have a file that contains just one expression, which is the number and, well, that's the expression. So it has been just evaluated, obviously, to itself. So that's not very interesting. What's more interesting is to see uh, what would be the type of this expression. And the type of this expression would be uh, would be checked by the, another utility script that comes with a Scylla compiler uh, as a type checker. And this is the mandatory pass uh, for the deployment of Scylla contracts to the blockchain. So no contract must be deployed before it satisfies the type checker. Because this way we make sure that the contracts are free from certain classes of bugs. So this contract, well, this expression successfully passed the check and says that the value uh, 32-bit uh, 0 is indeed is of type 32-bit integer. So what you see on top is the value, what you see below is the type of this value. And, well, let's comment this region, comment this one, see what else we there. So uh, obviously we have different kinds of, um, different kinds of uh, integers, 
which is kind of boring, just to show that, well, there are some basic sanity constraints here. Uh, for example, if we type, try to type check this class, well, there will be an error right away. And it's actually, it will be not even a type error, it will be syntactic error, <laughs> saying that we are trying to make an unsigned integer with a negative value. So that's not good. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, programming without strings. So here comes the string. Um, as we know them in the languages, well, pretty much any language has strings like that. So uh, the type of that will be string. So currently we are just running some sanity checks on the primitive values, and obviously anyone can see that this is a string. Like, come on, what else can it be? Uh, well, things get slightly interesting when from the ordinary character Unicode strings, we get to byte strings. So byte strings, they're quite paramount in the blockchain-based program because they encode the results of hashing, and hashes is a bread and butter of the contracts, so this is typically what you store in your state if you want to implement a non-trivial, interesting game where, I don't know, people play rock, paper, scissors without giving a winning strategy to the one that starts first. Actually, implementing rock, paper, scissors and smart contract is a very good exercise that you'll be given a chance to uh, try and still at the end of this workshop. So, uh, but in any anyway, event, if you want to do it in an intelligent way, you need to employ the hashes. And hashes are byte strings. So what else are byte strings? Addresses of the entities of the, on the blockchain are byte strings. And for byte strings, we introduce the first piece of um, non-triviality. So byte strings in Scylla are syntactically represented by literals that start from 0x, and then there, there comes a bunch of um, uh, hex characters, uh, 0 to 9 and then a to f. So, uh, but the type actually depends on what string it is. So that type of this one, so let me add a couple more, will be byte string tree. So that is a byte string that requires uh, three bytes for some code. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because uh, we looked at the value of that, and the type checker has inferred the bit depth of this string. So this is actually very interesting because that's what's in the programming, in the mainstream programming called dependent types. So this is the type that doesn't just say that this is a byte string. So this is a byte string of a certain length. Why is it important? Well, because uh, if you want to compare uh, two byte strings of different lengths for something like equality or a distance between them, then this operation is simply undefined on the strings of different lengths unless you take certain conventions that might differ from platform to platform. So what's the better solution? Is to uh, introduce the tags that actually track the bit length the bit depth of the strings. And statically, you know that if you're trying to compare two strings of a different uh, bit depth, then uh, you are doing something fishy, and you might want to convert one to another by, let's say, padding. But this operation should be made explicit. So you don't want to trust um, the runtime to do that for you. OK, so uh, this, is, this is the first non-trivial exercise that introduces not just the literals, but the first contraflow construction of Scylla. And this is the construction that is simple as brick, that is called lab binding. So you can think of it as declaring and assigning an immutable variable right away. So the variables in Scylla uh, declared of this form, they do not um, require providing the types, because the type of x is inferred from what is being assigned to x. And here we assign two byte strings, and obviously we expect the result to say whether they are equal or not. So let's. So uh, the result of this program is not the byte string. So it operates with the byte strings, but the result should be of different type. Guess which one? Louder. Boolean. Yes. So many people say boolean. Let's actually try to check if that's the case. Yes. We have bool. And actually, Boolean is not a primitive type in Scylla, and it's a separate, there's a separate story about Boolean and the way it's treated. But, okay, that's cool. So, um, we actually, we know that it's Boolean, so this result is going to be either true or false, and we now can evaluate that. And it is. It's false, and also it gives some additional information about the variables that we have created on the way. So there is an x and there is a y. So that's actually a very nifty utility if you want to experiment. So let's see if I actually try to mess around with that. So let's delete a couple of, uh, let's delete a byte and see if it, oh, <laughs> sheesh. It's actually, if you run it, it now breaks at runtime because the runtime doesn't know how to compare strings of different lengths because they haven't been properly padded and padding is something that we should have done. But that's the problem that you don't want to have at runtime, right? So uh, you could actually avoid it 
by running the type checker. And finally, the type checker does something useful. It complains. It says, you know, here's a type error. You try to compare for quality the two values that have actually types that do not match. So one of them is a byte string of the depth 30 and another is to, uh, 21. This is something that you actually want to know before you run your contract. And this is exactly what the type checker gives you. And remember the motto, well-typed programs don't go wrong. So if the program is actually well-typed, no errors of this and many other kinds would take place in it. Okay, so we are sort of approaching the end of the boring part, which are the values. So as a separate value, we have the block numbers. So block numbers is uh, actually quite a frequent entity in the blockchain-based programming, because that's the only way you can have time on the blockchain. So blocks, they grow monotonically as integers, and every time a miner mine, uh, decides to include a transaction into a block, that block is going to have a number. And uh, the computation that this transaction might have involved in a certain smart contract, they should be able to refer to the block number. Why is it useful? Well, because, for example, in the crowdfunding um, contract that Hanman has mentioned early on, uh, you might want to have a deadline. And the deadline is a certain time. Well, you have no real time on the blockchain. How do you express it? You express it as a block number. And the block numbers, they come with certain operations, so you can compare them. Okay, so uh, the way to declare a block number, a constant block number is like that. You also have a way to check what is the block number in which your contract-based computation runs uh, in the appropriate transaction. So if we try the type check, the type will be block number. And there is a bunch of operation on that. Okay, the final primitive type is the type of messages. So those are intentionally made to uh, resemble associative arrays in uh, something like JSON, because this is exactly how they are fed to the block. So messages are essentially the interesting results of the contract-based computations that propagate back to the blockchain. So as a result of its computation, the contract uh, needs to emit a message. And this message is better have several fields. Oh, no sound now. So uh, it's better have several fields and several values that this field carries. So this is a message that is going to have two fields, A and B, and those fields are going to uh, bound, bind two integers. So the type of this thing is message. All right, so we are done with primitive values, which is essentially all you need to know to write simple programs. Questions, please. Um, so I ran this file uh -huh. with uh, eval runner, and it has two lines in the output. One is Ah, okay, that's a good question. So, uh, the, let's just check the hypothesis, because uh, that script has been written a long time ago. But I think the curly braces, they are supposed to show you... Uh, yeah, oh, oh. That one, it shows yeah. well, you can probably infer what it means. So, that shows you all the, uh, all the dynamically bound local variables in the course of the execution. Right. So, yeah, so, so you basically like said... the entire program state. It is the entire local program state, yeah. So the, Exactly. So for contracts, it's slightly more convoluted, but we consider it beneficial to introduce for us the expression fragment because that's the that's ninety percent of the language. Thank you. That's a good question. I think there is a flag where you can switch it off, but uh, I don't remember what it is in the in the script. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, for messages, is the key a string? Or? Come again? Uh, you know, in the messages, it's, it's as A and B. Are those? Those are represented as strings, but uh, they are not literal strings in the language because we decided that's too much, too many quotes. So the syntax basically says write them as atoms without quotes. But when this thing is going to be on the blockchain, it's going to be serialized into JSON as a string. So there will be a string A colon string that represents the value. So I noticed that you can add numeric values as well. If it's like A, you can do like A1, A2. That's right. A, yes. A2, one, A. You can do one A, that's right. Okay, uh, okay so uh, I was not planning to go into precise specification. So uh, the convention is that you can only have the alphanumeric identifiers in the string in the string case. Thank you for the question. That's a good one. More. So how do you run the uh, evaluator? Uh, currently you need to build Scylla as a project, and it will have a later as, as one of the utilities in the folder. So I think it should be all in the review file. In the GitHub. In the GitHub, so uh, there will be instruction on building it 
and there's still a GitHub itself, and there will be instruction and running in uh, the readme of that uh, repository that we are currently going through. Awesome. Okay, so let's actually write some programs with structured control flow. Okay, so uh, we've already seen that we can have um, let expressions that allow us to confer things for, uh, bind things before we do <coughs> them. So that's the thing with Scylla. Quite annoyingly to the newcomers, uh, Scylla is actually a language that sort of is in static single assignment or a normal form, if you know what they are. So every intermediate every intermediate expression is first bound to a variable, uh, and only then it can be used. So uh, contrary to what you might expect, you cannot write ek in 1, in 2, you need to bind them first. Why did we decide this way? Well, because that makes language way easier to analyze, and Scylla was not meant to be a long-standing only programming language that we have, so it was meant to be a, an intermediate language that something higher level will be compiled down to. But for the time being, every intermediate computation needs to be bind, bound, so that's just the sad reality. So again, so this is not a very interesting example. Okay, so what else we have? Uh, we actually have more interesting thing that now explains what the booleans are. So let's first check um, the quality of this integer and this unsigned integer. So first of all, if we just try to check them for equality, like in the previous program, that will not type check because uh, x and y, they belong to two different rings. So one is uh, signed 32-bit integer and another is unsigned 64-bit uh, bit integer. And obviously, in this case, you can unsafely coerce one to another at runtime. So uh, cast or coercion is the kind of error that the type soundness, the, 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 the type discipline sort of allows you to have. So you say the program doesn't go wrong, but it might fail due to the cast of the integers. So once you have casted one to another, so how do you do that? Well, you, can, you have a built-in constructor uh, uh, build an operation called uh, to uh, unsigned in 64. So if I, let me, let me reduce this problem a little bit. So if we delete this part and just return O as the result, the type of that is going to be option of, actually, sorry, the test is not going to fail. Sorry, I was I was more impression of the language than it actually is. So cast here are smart. So cast, they uh, will not uh, throw a runtime exceptions. Instead, they return a type which is called option. So option is uh, a very nifty replacement of uh, something that is typically handled with null in the language like Java. So in Java, null is usually the indicator of an error, right? And in functional programming languages, people thought of a different way. I wouldn't say better because it's slightly more verbose. Uh, is instead of uh, returning null, we return a value of type option. And type option has precisely two constructors. One of them, them is called sum and encapsulates the value that uh, your computation resulted in. And another is called none, which means that your computation has failed. So when you actually try to coerce one integer to another, and here we actually don't know whether it's going to succeed or not, the result is going to be of type option, because this coercion might fail at runtime, but it won't throw an exception. It will give you the result, and if we try to evaluate this thing, as it is now, it gives you some, because, meaning that this coercion was actually successful, and also the environment of all the things that were bound on the way that you can ignore. So sum means that we have coerced this 32-bit integer to this 64. Uh, to the to the 64 uh, base. Okay, now let's do something interesting. Sorry. Yeah. You have let x equals integer to one. What is the in at the end? In uh, that's the syntax that says uh, evaluate this expression, uh -huh. bind it to this variable, and then in well you can write a new expression. So you can think of it as semicolon here. That's just syntax which is quite quite paramount in functional languages, and uh, we we. We just um, borrowed it from there. So what happens there is actually quite interesting. Uh, you can see the construct that if you have never seen a, a, program, a functional programming language, you might be puzzled about. But this is essentially um, a case switch on steroids called pattern match. So it does the following thing. It takes a variable, in this case O, evaluates whatever value it has at the moment, 
And then, knowing that this variable is of certain data type that has a bunch of constructors, like the option type at sum and none, it tries to match them against each of the constructors. And the first one that matches here would actually uh, provoke more computation. So here it says, let's see what O is. We know that O is of type option, but we also know that option might be either sum or none. So in the case it's sum, it has some value in it. So we unpackage this value, and that's why it's called pattern matching, because we take the value and we sort of match it against all these patterns. So this is pattern one. And it says, well, uh, if O happened to be some value, let's call this value x1, and proceed by executing this, this expression. And if uh, O happened to be none, let's just return false. Okay. In both cases, the results of both <coughs> branches are of the same time. This is a must. So we cannot return bool uh, in, in one case and in, in another one, because then the program would not make sense, that meaning that the result of the, the type of the computation is actually different in both branches, and we cannot say anything interesting statically. What's more interesting is that uh, having this pattern matching actually makes it very easy to add uh, some additional check. check it's like. So this is actually a very bad program. This is the program that handles one case, but forgets to handle another one. Uh, and uh, having pattern matching uh, allows us to enhance the type checker, saying that, you know, this pattern match is non-exhaustive, saying that you have just forgot one option, which is okay for this particular program, because even though, you know, uh, low-type programs don't go wrong, but ill-type programs occasionally go right, so this program still evaluates to what it should. Uh, but if we change it just a tiny bit, for example, make here minus one, then this program will crash. And it will crash precisely because we forgot the other branch. And if we insert the other branch, it doesn't crash. And so uh, is the time checker uh, very happy because we haven't forgotten anything. So you see, types are your friends. So they give you lots of, I mean, they introduce certain annotation overhead. They kind of make you think slightly more about the code you're writing, but they give, the, 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 there are huge gains in terms of security and safety. So you can filter lots of classes of programs just by design. Okay, so that was about pattern matching. Then we'll see more and more of it because option is not the only, actually these things might be nested. So. Uh, this program will not type check, but we could also have something like this, which would be a value of option of option of something. But again, in this case, just give me a second. Um, in this case, uh, okay, let me say it. yeah, in this case, the type checker will complain. It will say, well, you know, O is supposed to be of type option of unit of unit since 64, but uh, the pattern matching uh, does something fishy with it because it tries to decompose it again. So let me change it back. Please. Um, yeah, so what I did with these uh, bias symbols, I had two different expressions uncommented at the same time, right? Um, and then when I ran it, the output of both the type checker and the bell run it was nothing. It didn't, it didn't have an error, but it just. Uh, I honestly don't remember what exactly is the expected result of this evaluator <coughs> on two expressions in the file. But we can do it right now. Yeah, okay, probably just says, it probably just knows it if, if there is more than one. Right. So but if there is, if there is, if it does something, it still gets executed. Uh, I don't know whether it has silent the output or it just did not execute it. So I think I, it's been a while since I looked at the code of this evaluator because it was mostly provided as an utility. Uh, but it might well just ignore whatsoever the input if there is more than one expression. All right, Pratik. So many times you, you have very complex uh, you know, patterns to match, sometimes there are lots of patterns to match. And I, I don't actually want to bother to write rules for every pattern. So, yeah. Uh, how do I turn off, like just for convenience reasons, if I just want to say you know, all these patterns don't deal with it? Fantastic question. So basically, if I have very uh, hairy data type uh, with lots of nesting and I want to pattern match on all the possible cases, how do I avoid writing, writing all of that? Okay, one way if you want to ignore uh, the foreign parts, you can just write this, and that would be the default pattern that matches the rest, oh. if you have some default logic for this thing. 
So this is this is still fine. This is still that checks and runs as, as it should. So you actually you can run, even run you can even do this thing, which still be fine, except it will not do anything anything interesting. And if you do this, then you actually need to be careful because the first thing it will just catch every possible pattern. Does so that's, does yeah. that incomplete about something like this? Uh, well, I actually don't remember, so let's see. Yeah! So, it says unreachable. How cool is that? Yeah. So we actually have the, the member of the team who wrote this feature only arriving tomorrow, but uh, yeah, that actually took quite a while. So that's uh, the programming language here in action. It actually is a very interesting problem how to check the exhaustiveness of your pattern matching. It compiles to a small automata and checks the, uh, the properties of the language that this automata accepts. Uh, I guess what else might be uh, um, good for have something that we always don't don't have is to have a decent IDE support for that. So a uh, long time ago in my career, I was working in a company that was producing IDEs, and for languages with pattern matching, what you can do, you can take the type of this O that you know statically, and you know that's an option, and you know what an option is, and then you can generate all these patterns automatically, and then the programmer will only need to fill the right parts with some interesting business logic. But this part actually doesn't have to be written, it can be auto-generated. It's still written because we don't have the premium ID support for, for the language. But again, statically typed languages, they give you a lot of freedom on what to write. More questions? No? No? Okay. Let's take a look at something interesting. So, uh, we have primitive types. We also have, yeah, so basically those were the primitive types. We also have algebraic data types. So, algebraic data types are interesting beasts. In, in a sense, they are similar to uh, classes and objects and languages like Java and C++. Although they come with more features and in some cases they have less features. For example, they have fields, they have components, but this, those components are not mutable. Uh, what do, what's the game for that? Well, the game that you can use them in the pattern matching and you can also, and you know that all hierarchies, they are sort of statically fixed. So we know that option, if you think of it as an after class, only had two subclasses, some and none. That would allow us to reason about the exhaustiveness of pattern matching. If we would be in Java, option could be extended even further, and we would never, never know if we covered all the subclasses, all, all the subcases of the, of the option class. So uh, in uh, full-blown languages like uh, Scala, Haskell, or Camel, uh, users can define their own algebraic data types, uh, but we were not sure how many, like whether this is going to be a high demand feature. Uh, we actually might want to introduce it eventually. Uh, but we just fixed a number of uh, algebraic data types that the language can have. And the first algebraic data type, so now we are in the file number three, is what you already seen. It's a Boolean. And the Boolean, it comes with two constructors, either true or false. And another algebraic, uh, algebraic data type we have is a pair. But pair is interesting because pair is polymorphic type. And when I say polymorphic, you should think with generics. If you speak Java. So, uh, and then you need, uh, whenever you want to create an instance of a pair, you also need to provide those types. This is again because uh, Scylla is meant to be minimalistic. In a language like Okamo, you could have omitted those, and those would be inferred from the types of X and B, both B and bool, but we are not the smart, so we require to say bool and bool here, even though this is redundancy, because we all obviously know that X is of type bool and B is of type bool. So, on here, this bool and bool say what are the first and the second component of the type components. So if we actually do something like that, that thing will likely not touch. Yeah. So it says, well, you know, we have said that the type is going to be 32, but you lied. You provide four. And well, if you forget them whatsoever, the type checker will also complain. Says, well, you know, constructor pair expects that you would say that you use two types, but you said that you are not going to use. Okay, so this is about the pair, but if all these things succeed, uh, then we are good. Then our result is a pair of two components, and the first is a boolean, and the second is a boolean. And uh, if we try to evaluate it, yeah. That is exactly the pair that we have, and you see it has two components, and the first is boolean, and the second is boolean. So, uh, why, why bother constructing pairs? 
Well, because we want to um, encapsulate values in them. <coughs> How do we get the values out of pairs? Well, by using the old good friend pattern matching. So here is the same program, but now enhanced with the follow-up. And the follow-up takes this P, <coughs> says, well, pair likely has just one constructor, which is a pair. And this constructor has two arguments. And you see, uh, with algebraic data types, when you have defined the constructor, you also sort of define the destructor. So you know how to construct the value of pair by providing two arguments, but you also know how to take these values out of pair. So it's like you get the getters for free on the expense that you cannot mutate the fields. So this thing is immutable. Once you constructed the pair, the only way to change the values that are within this pair is to construct another pair. That is something that sort of gives you the benefits of having the pattern matching and the static typing discipline. So uh, here, this program, um, what do you think would be the overall type of the program? Bool. Yeah, I seem to be asking questions to which the only answer is bool. I, I should change that. But you're right. And thank you for following. Um, yeah, it's bool indeed. And, well, you can imagine what would be the result. Okay, so pairs are quite <coughs> versatile. So here, uh, let's do something crazy. And write the first properly functional program. So now, here in this program, you can see that the first two variables, they have very interesting values. They are lambdas. Lambda expressions, aka anonymous functions, aka first class functions, uh, sometimes called closure, but that, that is wrong. Oh, I know why, why it was speaking, because you think that this thing is, is, is a function of e. All right, uh, so we have two functions. One of them takes an argument, x of type 32-bit uh, integer, and doubles it, adds it to itself. Another takes a string and sort of also doubles it, concats it with itself. And the interesting thing is, uh, actually, let me erase this thing and just type check this thing. So here you see the functional type. Remember we had that. So this is the type of the function that takes an argument of the type int and gives the same argument, the argument of the same type back. So uh, g would be of a different type, string string. And if we try to evaluate this program as it is, uh, it wouldn't say anything interesting because representation of functions is a tricky part and we do not render them in. So you can represent it syntactically, but also you just know that it's a function. So this is actually one of the dangers. So functions are really tricky beasts. And there is a lot of open problems about how to represent the function so you can transmit them across distributed system. And this is fine if your functions sort of top level functions. So you can just enumerate them, give them names and or send their text. But uh, your but functions might actually capture parts of the variable, uh, parts of the environment where they are created. And then what? You need also to capture that environment. And this is how essentially we, uh, there are certain solutions to that problem, but we didn't see an explicit need to capture first class functions for the sake of storing them on the blockchain. And that's why the type system prohibits sending functions and storing them to the state whatsoever. So you can have functions as administrative expressions in your program, that is fine. You can ha even have them as a part of your standard library. But you can say, oh look, I've created a cool function, let me put it in the message and send it to my friend. Because that just will create the whole class of problems. And while it's exciting from the research perspective, we, we were not sure if we need that much of expressivity. But the kind of expressivity that we sort of expected that we will need is that we might want to treat functions as first class values. So in this sense, functions are not different from integers, booleans, they still can be, for example, packaged to the pairs. So we have a pair of two functions here. And as before, when we create this pair, it expects the two input types. And then, well, here is string ABC. And now we can take the pair and package it, take the second component, uh, give it a different name, and finally apply it here. So that is the syntax for applying the function. Just the function identifier, and then one or more arguments to it. So here we apply G1. To, and even though it looks like a convoluted problem, program, uh, we have our sanity checker saying that actually there is nothing wrong with this program. It still returns something with type string. So if we evaluate it, uh, that's the result. Well, yeah. Um, is it possible in the pattern match to express the parametric type that a matcher needs to match? 
Uh, yeah. That pair can be any pair, right? But can you say that I want a pair of eight and eight only? Uh -huh. Question. Why do we need, why do we mention types when we construct, but we do not mention the types when we destruct? So uh, the answer to that is that that is actually the redundancy that is strictly not necessary. Because when you type check the pattern matching, you already know the type of the scrutiny, what you are actually going to pattern match. So uh, yeah, you could put it with a different type, but uh, at the moment that when you analyze this thing, you already know its type. And so you know the pattern that match there is merely to aid extraction. Exactly. Exactly. So moreover, more pattern matching is smart, so it actually knows that since P came to be with these two types, so it knows how to project those types to the types of the components because it knows something about the intrinsics of how the pair works and so about other data types. So it knows that the second component is actually going to be of this type. And that's why this whole thing type checks because all branches of the pattern matching have the same type and that's the type of the second component of the pair which is string, which is this type of this which makes this application legitimate. So I've just type checked this whole thing to you, and this is precisely what the type checker does in this internal. Please go ahead. Uh, can a function accept another function as argument? Absolutely. That's the bread and butter of Scylla programming. Those are functions called combinators. And, and therefore return a function as a result. Oh, yeah. And it can also return a function that takes a function and return a function. And you can nest it as much as you want. It's, it's, it's quite fun. And we're going to see that. Okay, so let me comment this beast. Um, options, uh, we've seen them already. So I will probably, uh, one thing that I have to show is how to construct options from scratch. So option has two constructors, sum and none. And uh, somewhat unexpectedly, when you construct the none, even though it doesn't take any arguments, you still need to provide the type. Because that's the type of the option to which this none belongs. So it's like, you know, in Java, this is actually a big flow of Java type system. There are research papers published on that, how heaven now in Java makes it unsound, because now essentially has any type you want, and you don't want to have that, because that like, opens the whole bag of worms to exploit the program. So uh, because option is a somewhat type safe substitution for heaven now, we cannot afford heaven like one now for all of them. So this now is specific now. That's a null that lives in the option of Boolean, and we need to provide that annotation here. Because if you don't, we uh, that might be a null from a different option. And then you can do something useful. Okay. Uh, the last data type that we are going to have is probably the most interesting one, and the source of most of the exercises that we can come up with. That's a data type of, uh, of lists. So um, lists are actually... Uh, so we, we call them lists, but in fact they are sort of trees, except they're very, very flat. So the way you represent algebraic lists is by saying, well, a list, it's, it's, it's a, uh, so you do it recursively. So you say the list is either an empty list called nil, and you say that's an empty list of what? So the whole bag of nothing. And then uh, you can grow the list by adding more head to it, like you now playing the snake game. So uh, the way to make one element list is to make an empty list and attach a head to it. And the head here is x. And this head stores the element which is 1. And that is the list of the length 1. So if we just type check this thing, it will say that's a list of integers. The type sort of obscures the information that this is the list of length 1. But if we evaluate it, we will see that. So that's a list that has a head and it has a tail and the tail is 1. All right, and you can grow that as large as you want. So um, let's see what's going to happen here. So here, uh, now we can get the elements from the list. So And here, the pattern magic is quite interesting. Uh, it was working quite interesting. It says that if the list is a cons and it has a tail t and a hat h, return the hat. So again, we could have tried to mess with type checker, say, what if it's returning the tail? Well, it says, well, no, it's not too good. Because in one branch you return the list, and another you return just the element of the list. So the only right way to do here is to return the head. So and this is what you do with lists. But lists is pretty much the only way, uh, actually one of the two ways you can implement collections. In <coughs> and lists they have very nice set of properties. Because any way to uh, modify the list or uh, introspect on it or do something useful with it is to iterate for it. 
And it turns out that most of the logic that you would otherwise write with loops, you can actually, can, you can actually do by making a list and traversing it in one way or another. It's quite interesting because you can even implement sorting as a of a list as a traversal there. So what I have here. Yeah, so and finally we have, sorry, a bunch of library functions. So for example, if you want to compute the length of the list, you do not have to uh, write it from scratch. There is already a library. And this function, this length, it comes with this add sign before the application, because first, before it's applied, it needs to be instantiated. So this is something that we'll see very soon, but list length is a parametric function. So it works for lists of any kind, no matter what are the types of elements that this list stores. But when we actually want to apply it, we want to be specific of which kind of elements the list has. And here we say, well, compute the length, so uh, compute the length of the list of 32-bit uh, integers. So what the program does, it constructs the list of two elements, and, and then it computes its length. And the result is unsigned integer. And if we evaluate it, the unsigned integer, the specific unsigned integer, it's two. So this is how we construct the length of the list, but the library is quite rich, so it has all kinds of iterations, it has sorting, it has filtering, it has mapping of the list and transforming it into other lists uh, with different properties. Uh, that's something you can read in the source. So, okay, so we've uh, two-thirds through, through, two um, uh, through uh, the tutorial. Any questions about data types? Because these are pretty much all the data types you're going to see in Scylla. There will be one more, which is maps, but those are the primary ones. And sort of, seems like not too much, but you can write pretty much everything you want in font context. Yeah? Uh, could you write an example, say, list length? as a function to show how you recursively go down the list. To yes, I'm about to do that right now. Okay. That's coming on the next, in the next uh, part of the tutorial. Okay. No? 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 No. All right, cool. Yeah, let's, let's see what we've seen so far. So we've seen functions, we've seen polymorphic functions. Yes, so uh, this is how, oh yeah, so uh, one type that I haven't shown, we also have natural numbers that are sort of complementary through integers, but they are through unsigned integers, but they allow to iterate. So this is actually how we iterate. That big, scary function has a polymorphic type that precisely implements the iteration. So how do you implement the iteration through a natural number? So natural numbers, uh, mathematical natural numbers, they are actually designed recursively. Not many people realize it, but that's just what gives uh, a way to implement proof techniques such as mathematical induction. Natural numbers are either zero or the successor of the natural number, which is recursive definition. And if you want to prove something by induction, you prove that it holds for zero, and then you prove that it from the fact that it holds for n, it holds for n plus one. And this is the way natural, natural numbers are implemented, but induction in mathematics, it's the sister of recursion in programming. So if you want to uh, implement a recursive procedure, that takes that does something interesting with the natural number. You actually don't even have to write the function recursively. You can actually <coughs> implement what's called the recursion principle, which you can think of as an induction principle. So the recursion on natural numbers will require you to say, what do you do? What do you return if your number is zero? And what do you do if your number is not zero, but rather some natural number? How do you combine the values? So this is a higher order parametric function. And this is what implements the structure recursion. And finally, it takes the actual number, which is your iteration. So you can think of it as a four, uh, as a four operator from Java in this case. And for lists, it's even it's slightly hairier, but it's exactly the same. So you remember that lists they were defined also inductively. So we had an empty list, and for any list, we had a way to construct the bigger list by attaching a head. And if you think of it, this is how we would recurse over the list. We would say what to do for an empty list. And we would say what to do if we already have a tail and we have a, we have a head, we have a tail, and we have some result obtained by processing this tail. So how do we get the new one? Well, you provide this function. And then you provide the actual list that you want to recur over. So we call that, so there's a proper way for that, the structure recursion, and the jargon name for this is fold, because essentially you take the list and you fold it. 
And now here comes now here comes the oh it's actually not here. I think it's here. Yeah. Here comes the file where we hold. So um, this is how we implement addition, but addition of natural numbers. So uh, first we take this natural principle and say that uh, our result is going to be the natural number. And then uh, we, uh, it's actually a very interesting exercise if you try to implement the addition of two natural numbers if you only have the folding. So what happens is that you actually need to take, you, you get two natural numbers and you iterate through the first one. And uh, when you reach the end, you uh, return the second one and then you kind of add the first one. So you see in the base case, so when we want to uh, compute the addition of n and m, in the zero case, we just return m. And in the non-zero case, we just add another layer. <coughs> so basically you, uh, in, the, in the natural number, replace it zero with another natural number that gives you the sum of two natural numbers. Is it really so? Well, uh, let's try uh, Let's first try to see if this addition function type checks. <coughs> so I think that's file number five. Yeah, so that's the function that takes a natural number, a natural number, and returns a natural number. Okay, so now uh, let's add something. So let's make five, let's make six, let's convert them both to natural numbers, <coughs> and eight, and add one to another. So and there, so the results, I'm sorry, I forgot to say it. So the result will be not, and, and the actual value of the result will be <coughs> 11. So who is that? So why actually go through the trouble of adding numbers in a so convoluted way? Well, obviously we have a built-in function that would take the sum of the two numbers. But that just demonstrates that this folding to the natural numbers is a very general mechanism that you can implement to use iteration. And in fact, to implement iteration, you don't need a loop. You need to have this higher order function. All right. Uh, but, yeah. Mac and C double C, those are like built into Yes. So three recursion principles are built into Scylla. So one for natural numbers and two for lists. And for lists, there are that fold left and fold right, and they correspond to the way of traversing the list from the left or from the right. And for natural numbers, there is actually a theorem that says that no matter how you traverse it, it's all going to be the same. So, mm. yeah, that's why we will So in, uh, in more interesting uh, programming languages that are only used in academia and mostly for proving, uh, there is a way to derive those recursion principles from the definitions of the data type. And something, this is something that we are seriously considering implementing once we have the user-defined uh, data types. So you can think, we don't have a tree as a data type, but you can think that if you have a tree, which would have either empty tree or the node with two subtrees, a binary tree. Then the recursion principle for the tree would be do something for the empty tree and do something for the two subtrees and the node. And this is something that you can well derive uh, automatically. But we so far have encoded these three recursion principles. Please go ahead. Um, so I see the function always only takes in one argument. Yes. So the function is, yeah, so the syntactic form for the function is to take it one argument, so if you want to have functions over many arguments, uh, function to function to function to function. Brilliant question, by the way, that's called carry. So in uh, languages like Okama and Haskell, if you have a function of multiple arguments, you can fix them in the order they come. Yes. And that's called carry function in honor of Haskell carry who made an appearance earlier, earlier today. And this is something which is just more transparent here, so we didn't produce the syntax for multiple parameters because that would be the function that returns the function. Great question. More. So, so we can have more arguments for a function. Absolutely. You just write them down. Yeah, you just write the chain, chain function that returns a bunch of functions. So uh, actually, I think I jumped to one file. So here's a bunch of functions that you can see. So here's a function that implements. OK, so here's, a, here's an interesting. This is actually a library function. Uh, you don't have to write it every time you want. So this is the function that uh, takes the head of the list. So that's a function that takes a list of 32-bit integers and checks if the head, if this uh, list actually has a head, then it returns the sum of this head. 
if the list is actually beheaded, it returns none. So it's a type safe function in the sense that it doesn't fail even for an empty list if you return something. And this result type will be option of int 32. Oh, list, list, int, uh, list option. Uh, let's just check it. Yeah, that's what it does. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, there is one more example that is sort of just here to blow everyone's mind. So can we have functions that take functions and, uh, and return functions? So this is an extremely convoluted way, although if you actually try to do it, you see there is nothing particularly redundant here. To write a function that takes two other functions and returns their composition. So that's the function that which uh, takes f, takes g, uh, and a is of type a to b, and g is of type b to c. So the result will be the function from a to c, something that will be a composition of g applied after f to its argument. But this function is written in as general form as possible. So it doesn't even say what are the input and the output results of the functions f and g. And that's why those are made type parameters. For this, there is a syntax Fun. So let's <coughs> actually type check this function. Uh, I think I haven't saved. Still. Uh, I ah, I know why. Because I. Yeah. yeah. Let me just clear and let you. So this is the type of our function. It's a type that has three generics, A, B, and C that stand for the types of inputs and outputs of the function. And then there come actual function type, which is A to B, to B to C, to A to C. So that is a type of function composition. And if we want to use it, we can first instantiate those A, B, and C, the types, being something more specific, which in this case happens to be in 32, option in 64, and option in 128. And then we just compose this thing. So uh, basically, if I just stop here, there will be a refined type of this function that is now not having any for alls because it's for specific types. And it's function in 32 to option in 64, option 64 in the, uh, 128, and then in 32 to option 128. Uh, so that's the composition. Um, I order functional programming and at its, uh, at its marvel. Okay, so that was about functions. So here we have lots of exercises. So here we have folding over lists. So these are all parts of the standard libraries. Uh, the pinnacle of that is to implement sorting of a list through this, uh, through this folding. And well, somebody asked how to implement the lens. In the view, so here's the implementation of the lens. So the implementation of the lens takes lists of elements of any type, hence the type parameter, and then it takes the self list, and then it defines the fold as for this type, and the result of the fold is going to be an unsigned integer 32 bit, and if the list is empty, then the result is zero, that's what we return in the base case, and if the result is non empty, we just add one to whatever we have computed for the tail of this list. So unfortunately, I don't have a whiteboard here. So last time I presented here, I actually drew the picture of the list being empty, and then plus one head, plus another head, plus yet another head. And then what you need to do mentally when you write the folding over the list, you just replace each element of the list by the function that you apply there. And the function there is plus, so the plus one. And in the beginning you have zero, and then you have plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, gets you the length of the list. So this is how you inductively iterate for the list. So uh, that is pretty much it about the functional component of Scylla. Uh, one thing that I would like to show before we proceed to more relevant things that is writing context. But seriously, that's the entire language. And it took me, what, slightly more than one hour to explain uh, most of the interesting parts. So uh, you also have maps. So maps are sort of more efficient way to represent associative arrays, which and indeed you can do with lists. But just maps, they have better performance and they require the constant, the constant complexity way to address the elements. So here is the code that creates an empty map whose keys are 
32-bit integers and whose values are strings. And maps, they come with a bunch of operations. So you can create a map, you can create a key, you can create a value, and then you can use a built-in operation to boot this key with this value into this map. So again, the type, if we type check the type, this is going to map. And the result is going to be mapped with exactly one entry that maps 30, 40, uh, 42 into ABC. And put is uh, a pure operation, so put will actually return a new map every every time. So um, so here, if we actually add another thing and make it 43. So this is how you would put several values. And this is now we have a map of two values. So if uh, the maps are actually in the contract state, there is a more concise syntax to manipulate them, also with better complexity, but this is sort of an advanced feature that you won't need so often. OK, so that was literally 90% of civil language. And if you don't believe, then uh, if, if it seems surprising that you can actually write something useful, then trust, trust us if you can. Because we wrote lots of contracts just using this uh, this syntax. Please go ahead. So, so if if food creates a new match every time, doesn't that uh, mean that you need to create a lot of variables to store if there are a lot of manipulations? Uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, do we actually need a lot of intermediate variables for the manipulation? Uh, and the answer is yes, but those variables they are not stored on the blockchain, so they exist locally. Uh, when you execute this code, and that would be the case in any language which you would compile, so it would not have those, but it would. Like, any compiler for a higher language would have this in the intermediate stage, and we just cut the middle one. No more. All right. Okay, so we are approaching the end. So, that's the whole syntax of the language that you've seen. I don't have to go through it because I just show all of it. So uh, those were expressions. So uh, Scylla actually has an imperative fragment, which is more like uh, languages like Pascal, Java, or C, except most of the computations do not happen there. Most of the computations happen only in tiny fragments of it, being the expression. But once you start implementing the contract, you actually need to change the fields of the contract. And you also need to... Uh, assign. Uh, you also need to read from the blockchain and you need to read from this field. So this is why we also have, this is the language on top of the one that I just presented, which is way smaller. And this is the language for manipulating with the contract state. So I'm not going to show any specific small examples for this. So I'll, I'm going to show one contract, basically the crowdfunding that was mentioned by Hanman. And here what is happening is that F is a field, and this is a syntax from a reading, for reading from the field, into a local, into a new variable. This is the syntax for assigning to a field from a variable. And this is the syntax where the interesting part happens, assigning the result of evaluating the expression to the variable and the expression fragment we've seen. We also have a pattern matching, but at the level of statements. This looks like we are reading from the field, except we are reading from the blockchain state. So this is something that uh, you require in order to interact with the blockchain layer and, for example, to read the current block. This is the statement that has a very peculiar semantic. So, you know, in Ethereum, when somebody contra contacts the contract, uh, the first thing that the contract does is accept the money that come in this request. And uh, we decided that, okay, and then Ethereum introduced certain modifiers and solidity, like payable, so that would be more paramount, that something like that is happening. So we decided that we actually want to make it absolutely explicit that at certain path of execution, the contract is going to take the money that are coming its way, and accept it, i.e. move to their own states. And that's why there is an accept statement that says, well, take the money that were meant for me and accept it. Otherwise, well, we might end up in the branch where we don't even want to accept the money. We just want to say the, uh, the sender, well, no, I don't want to give you money. Yeah, I'll it. So, because if we do accept them by default, then we will have to reimburse them and, yeah, nice stuff. So, event, yeah, please go ahead. So, accept is on the at the contract level. So that's a statement, exactly. So you cannot have accept within the function. Uh, which sort of limits expressivity? Because uh, uh, there are certain things you might want to put into a library 
that you would just make this do with the state of the contract, but uh, certain things you can. Like neither of these statements can be part of the library function. So only pure stuff uh, is a part of the library. Uh, I think you were first. Uh, does it accept, accept the entire amount? That's true? Yeah. So, so what kind of types does the field have? Uh, yeah. So at the top level, when we declare the contract, we provide explicit types for the fields. So that sort of tells you what the type of F is. And when you read from F, X gets the same type. So they have the same kind of type. Yes. <coughs> yeah. As you yeah, so I don't show you the preamble of the contract. Well, I actually will show you. But when you write the contract, you say contract blah, parameters with certain types, as Hannah showed, and then fields with certain types. And this is what each transition of the contract does within itself. So it's, it is a sequence of these statements, which is simple imperative code, something most of you have written. So event, you can mentally replace event by log. So that says, um, actually, it's also sent. So event and send, they're very similar, except send is targeted says what well, sent messages to the recipients that those messages have. And the semantics of that is interesting. So unlike Ethereum, it's not fired right away. It's uh, delayed until the end of the contract execution, and then it's all flushed in the contract, and, and the recipients, they receive their messages, and they can react correspondingly with in a certain, uh, in a certain uh, sequential order, which is, uh, which is defined outside of the language. Okay. What's the opposite of an accept uh, when I want to send? Basically, send the money. Yeah, right. So send is part of the messages. MS is a list of messages. Each message can have a field. I think it's called amount. That uh, is processed specially, so that is processed as a matter. Uh, okay, and event is basically just broadcast event by means of recording on the blockchain that certain thing happened. But the input format is the same as for messages. So it takes one message. All right. Okay, so a little bit of latency symbol. So when you execute this uh, effectful thing, uh, you can think of it that it manipulates the fields, it manipulates contracts own funds, and it manipulates the incoming funds, and as a result, it produces a bunch of events and messages and also changes the state. So for example, the effect of accept on uh, this thing would be to take what's in the incoming and move it to the balance. So this is the state that is the subject of uh, manipulation by the statements. And also takes the blockchain state to read from. So the global execution model basically looks like this. So initially, all interaction with the contract starts by token account, manipulated by a human or some <coughs> software outside of the blockchain, saying, well, let me send a message to contract C. And the contract C will execute a transition that as a result will produce a buffer of messages, M2, M3, M4. So those messages are not fired until the contract C is done, hence no re-entrancy, no dull like bugs. What happens next is the messages from the outgoing buffer M2, M3, M4 are going to be delivered to the contracts. And this is now what's outside of the language fragment, and this is something what's underlying blockchain, i.e. Zilliqa defines, but well, we're still in the process of experimenting what is the right way to sequentialize the message-based interaction. So M2, M3, M4 currently are going processed bread first. So M2 might provoke contract D, produce more messages, targeting somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. And so can uh, contract E. But first what's going to happen is that contract D is going to finish its transition, and then M3 is going to be delivered to the account, probably giving it some funds, and contract E is also going to get its message. And then contract D's message is going to fire and deliver. So basically you think of it as a graph that you traverse bread first. Why not that first? Well, because we thought from the fairness perspective, bread first is better, but maybe it doesn't matter that much. Yeah, so this, this is something that we haven't quite fixed yet. So here we actually have a cycle, so that looks like a re-entrancy, right? Except that is not a problem, because by the time M6 uh, fired from contract E to contract C, contract C has already finished all the logic it was aiming to do at the time when this whole thing started. So that's going to be a new transition on contract C. So obviously you can, like there are ways to shoot yourself into the foot, but uh, at least something like reentrancy, which happened like, which happened to be harmful in the case of DAO, and was in the presence uh, of this communication in the middle of the computation, that's not gonna be the case here. Please go ahead. So can there be a situation where F4 is um, sent out, uh, and then uh, M6 happens, but M3 and M2 have not yet? 
Well, that is very much up to the semantics of the blockchain, and currently the way this picture is sequentialized is that M2 and M3, they take effect before M6, because it's breath first. Between M2, 3, and 4, which goes first? Is that guaranteed? Uh, between M3 and 4, they go first. Uh, they go in the order uh, C has added them to the buffer by means of the That's guaranteed. That's guaranteed, yeah. But then it could have, I mean, <coughs> uh, it, 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 from contract B, there was a path to contract C. There could have been, but that would be handled in its own, in its own order. So you see, uh, it looks very much like the picture for asynchronous interaction between agents, except it's not truly concurrent. So the blockchain layer, the protocol, is the one that fixes the order in which these messages are processed. And I'm saying just that one solution that we adopted at the moment, without exploring all the application, is to traverse this graph first. Um, is there a way to make the message just public so that you have to fail for some reason and want to fail? Uh, so what you're asking is, is there not the message, messages are atomic and transitions are atomic. So there is no way the transition, like the transition of E might uh, succeed and the transition of C might fail. Uh, so basically like this, this is just snapshot of one transaction. This, this whole thing is atomic. So it succeeds or fails in once. Oh, okay. But you might, yeah, but so all, all of them together. Exactly. Oh, okay. exactly. But uh, I, I was just for a moment, I thought, okay, is there a way to synchronize two contracts that they for sure fail atomically according to their internal logic? That's, well, I mean, you can engineer crazy interaction patterns if you actually have the control over more than one contract. Can you force uh, a execution uh, with, with That's how it's encoded at the moment. That might change in the future, though. <laughs> but again, you see, the language, the language story ends as at the moment the message are fired. And uh, how exactly the blockchain layer, thank you, that's actually a great question, because uh, that shows the separation, I should have added a different slide, how the what is the separation of concern between the programming language layer and what the guarantees it gives you, and the systems layer and how they interact. So the language story ends when the contract C fires the messages. And then the blockchain takes over and says, okay, this is gonna go first, and this is gonna go second, and this is gonna go third, and then sort of gets the call back it goes back to the language layer, and the language layer takes care of how contract D handles its messages. I'm not sure if it's more confusing than explaining, but <laughs> that's the way it is. Please go ahead. Uh, what prevents the re-entrancy from M4 to M6? Uh, what prevents re-entrancy uh, from M4 to M6? Well, the definition of re So. Uh, the re-entrancy, as uh, happens in Ethereum, says that you can uh, invoke the code of other contracts in the middle of execution of your own contract. That's not going to happen here because the transitions, they are atomic. And the invocation happens by means of sending the message at the moment when the transition of C has already happened. So C is going to be executed again, just not re-entrancy. There is still might be a loop. That's the only way to have the unbounded loops in the language. So each transition is proven to terminate. Each interaction not. So okay. the way to make it terminate is to have gas costs, which we do have. Also good questions. Thank you. All right. So putting it all together, just reiterate what we've seen. Scylla contracts are state transition systems come with the micro transitions. Interaction, all interaction between the contracts is by sending and receiving the messages. And messages, when they are delivered and they match the signatures of the transitions, they trigger factual computations by means of statements. And, well, multiple messages can be sent. But most of the computations, they happen not within the statements. So statements is essentially a build up on top of the computational problem to manipulate the state. Expressions is where you compute and, this, uh, and the properties of this expression, immutability of data types, and the uh, structure of iteration, what makes them nice to reason about. And we currently have a number of analyses, for example, the uh, complexity analysis of the contract that gives you the boundaries in terms of gas uh, of how much of it is going to be consumed. So that's something outside of the scope of this talk. 
And the structure of the contract uh, is as follows. You have a library of pure functions, you have immutable parameters, you have the fields, all come with explicit types, and then you have a bunch of conditions. Uh, okay, it says demo, but in fact it's just me showing you a very high level snapshot of the contract. So now at least the crowdfunding, that's the favorite one. Uh, yeah, so there is a there is an import that imports some standard library, and then there comes a library with the same as name as the contract that defines a bunch of pure functions, all in this let form, let and then a function, and those are the functions that can be used within these contracts. In principle, there is nothing wrong in letting other contracts to use these functions because they are immutable and they are not changing the state. Except we haven't implemented this mechanism yet. And then there comes the contract. It has three immutable parameters and has two pieces of state two fields, and then there come a transition. So donate, get funds, and claim back. So you see there is like a lot of repetitive structure due to pattern matching, something that presumably can be mostly generated from the templates. But again, that's the price for the minimalism of the language and the possibility to, impl to explain it entirely in uh, 90 minutes. All right, so... Um, Still, as a framework, actually has grown quite large in the past half a year as we've been actively working on it. So obviously there is standard validators for the syntax, and there is a runtime evaluator, and <coughs> as far as it goes, the blockchain level layer is only concerned uh, with this, so how to run the contracts. But there's a lot of infrastructure on top of it, and most of it is in this green part. And this is what I, something I would like to focus on. So currently, for the lack of a better name, we call the framework of checkers. And it all started from the fact that the contracts need to be type checked. We've seen how many bugs we managed to catch just by running the type checker. So the convention would be that uh, any client of the blockchain, before they deploy the contract, or before they accept the contract as a part of the transactions, and the contracts that are deployed in this code, they are not deployed as a bytecode that is very concise, but um, also practically impossible to type check. So there is no type system for EVM, for example. And that's why absolutely crazy stuff can happen there. It can crash in so many ways. So still is de deployed as this source code. If you want to execute it um, uh, efficiently on your client side, you are welcome to write your own JIT compiler for that and produce some efficient code. But uh, the possibility to partake, please. So I was just asking, so exceptions are still possible, right? Because I may run out of gas. That's right. Um, what's the semantics there? Like, how do I handle an exception? How do you handle well, the transaction interrupts? And there's no explicit. There is no try catch in the language. There's no try catch. In yeah. I uh, wish we might have had it, but yeah, it wasn't really needed. Yeah, so type system at the level of the contract, that's actually interesting. What would be the uh, global theorem the type system gives you the contract? So uh, the theorem is roughly as follows that if your contract passes the type checking and you manage to deploy it, then uh, any interaction with this contract will, file, will only fail in a very small number of known ways, either to out of gas or due to, um, or due to integer overflow, which present exceptions, or due to uh, bad pattern matching. But bad pattern matching is something that has taken care of by the <coughs> extra pass that I've shown you uh, that indicates the bad pattern matching. So ultimately, you Rest assured, so you can, if you deploy the contract under the type checking, you know that the only way for it to fail is either run out of gas or uh, get an integer overflow. And I, I, I'm 90% sure that integer overflow is something that you man manage to knock off with another checker. Which gets me back to this checkers framework. So type checker is like the mother of all static guarantees about the contracts. But once we've written it, it was so nice that we said, say, oh look, the pattern matching exhausting this checker, the one we've seen in action, it initially was the part of the type checker, but it conceptually doesn't have to be. Because type checking gives you certain guarantees, but then you can always improve it. And you can improve it further and further and further. So you can knock off the non exhaustive pattern matching, you can knock off uh, integer overflow, except that's not necessarily the core type checker. That's what's called the static analysis. And this checker framework that we have, and we sort of have a decent, although not very well documented, API for it, it allows you to write your own static analysis for Scylla contracts that might be the part of your deployment pipeline. It's a good point uh, how to convince everyone else to use this uh, checkers. And that's how we proceed from the blockchain uh, protocol layer to the social layer. So how to make sure that everyone deploys the contract after having type checked it. Or rather we can make the type checking 
an explicit uh, component of uh, mining the block. So if uh, somebody proposes the contract and everyone else is inclined to include it into a certain block, then they better run it through the suite of checkers that are out there. And that just makes the world a better place. So uh, bottom line, you can write your own checkers for that. And uh, last time we uh, gave a similar presentation, there were certain people who wrote like, very simple checkers, basically for syntactic structure, or some coding conventions, and whatnot, something that is, uh, that is possible to enforce. So, Brings it to the point, so how can you contribute? Well, it's open source, so you can try to implement uh, the contracts of interest and tell us how exactly this language annoys you. That would give us a better idea to uh, what, what the high-level language on top of it should look like. And maybe we can just auto-generate uh, some particular contracts from templates, given how small the syntax is. So tooling support, as was mentioned, and the language infrastructure checkers are uh, very, much, very much welcome. So before I conclude, I want to thank the fantastic uh, team uh, that has contributed to Sula in one way or another, and you can be a part of it. And there are more resources uh, at the main Sula site and in the GitHub repository. So this is all I have. Thank you. So with this in mind, I will hand it over back to Hanan, who can explain some immediate homework for that. <laughs> Uh, hi guys. So uh, my, I guess some of you have already cloned this uh, repo here. So uh, the worksheet can be located here. There's a worksheet uh, that you can download. Um, if you have not done so, please do now. Uh, you'll be working with uh, this worksheet and also using the 7 IDE. So we have a web IDE. Uh, this is the, the link here. I can expand it. 7-ide.zilica.com This is a web ID uh, and the binary is uh, remote so you don't have to compile Zilla if you haven't done so. So, yeah. The way to use this ID is pretty simple. On the left side there are all the um, sample contracts that's available. Hello World, crowdfunding, fungible tokens and things and so, so on and so forth. You can create a new contract, save it, type check it, and uh, you check for events and uh, reset and uh, there's other settings that's available. If you like to use Vim or Emacs, you can use it too. Um, and uh, on the right side, uh, this is uh, we have three tabs. The call, the state and deploy. To deploy contracts, you can just choose any arbitrary accounts. And then to, uh, whichever accounts that has a balance, you can deploy the contract. And uh, we can choose the source file here and deploy it. And once it's deployed, you can call the contract uh, once it has the address. So uh, for this this workshop here, I was, I'm planning to let you guys pl uh, do uh, do up a game called uh, Rock Paper Scissors. It's pretty simple. Uh, I, there's already um, all the library variables and um, debugging codes uh, functions and the immutable and mutable fields already um, already laid out for you. So the only thing that the challenge that you have to do here is to um, change up the transitions so that they could add checks for, let's say for here is add check whether if player one has already played. And uh, add, add another branch here for play, for checking for player two. So uh, the high level understanding here is that uh, we implement rock, paper, scissors as three numbers. And uh, let's say uh, player two plays people, it'll be two 
they want this uh, rock that is one to you compare if it's less than the number then you the player two it so this is basically how it works and uh, yeah this is uh, you, you just have to copy and paste this and put it into the um, Scylla ID and then you can work on it here uh, I think uh, I'll be trying to go around to see whether you guys need any help um, so you guys could tr probably start now if you want to play We are all here, so you can ask us questions. Feel free. Okay, so, so most of you guys already did this, which is the, to check the player whether he had played already. Uh, you have to first read um, the mutable field of one plate. It's a boolean flag. It's set to initialize as false first, but if you play this transition, it will be set to true. So, yeah, you check if it's true. Then, uh, sorry, if it's false, then you um, are supposed to do this, and if it's true, you're supposed to emit an event to say that you already played. Yeah, this is a um, basic concept here that uh, I guess already you guys already grasp. And uh, here is the matching for paper and scissors. Most of you duplicated it from the, the stroke. And uh, here is the Force branch is uh, to match whether it's player two. The reason why we need to see whether um, to see whether this sender, the caller of the contract, is player one or player two, is to not let random people play the contract. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is this branch. Uh, I think most of you guys can copy and paste the first branch to this. And uh, the last false branch here is that you're not a player. The it's an event to say so. And for the results branch, um, you guys will be checking for to see whether player 1 and player 2 has already played. If they already played, then it will give you a result. And the results uh, can be draw if it's equals to each other, because it's an integer here. Or if it's less than, um, it's, if this 1 is less than uh, player 2, it would give you. Uh, whether player one or player two wins. Here is uh, the case for um, rock. Here is the case for paper against rock and scissors against paper. So player two wins. And if uh, let's say it's the other way around, it's rock and scissors is the in each case, then it's player one winning. Yeah. So here it goes. And uh, yeah, you have to check this also to see whether the difference is by one. Uh, you cannot have three and one playing. Yeah. And uh, this is for the other case, well, for, for uh, checking player two against player one. And once this is done, you basically have the entire code. And also at the same time, I want to reward the player who won. So that's why I sent a message here. A message, uh, uh, this is a message type that we discussed earlier by Ilya, and uh, this is how we declare it. Um, this one message here is a library function that's declared at the top of the contract. It's basically creating a list of messages. Why do we need to create a list of messages? It's because you can actually package many messages in this list and send it out. So you can invoke, uh, you can call other contracts, well, multiple call other contracts, transitions. You can call multiple transitions at once. Yeah. So the tag here is, uh, let's say I have another contract that say get hello. I'll just put this get hello, the transition here. And then the recipient here will be the contract address. And uh, you'll be calling this another contract. This is uh, uh, implemented in the language over here. And um, here, you can see this amount is uh, basically sending a, a, a reward to the weak player that won. And uh, yeah, this uh, P1 code is just for you to, uh, it's, it's recorded down in the notes, so you can debug your code if there's any problems. Yeah, and it makes events, say player one, player two wins. And uh, we also add another two transitions. To reset the game, only the owner can reset the game and resets everything to zero or new. 
Uh, so like new string is just a non non string and non bool. Yes. So it is we, we we don't have a universal non type, that's why we need to declare this. And uh, yeah. And the last part is to add funds. Anyone can just donate to this uh, to this contract. But I don't know whether you want to, but if you if you want to you can just delete and it will accept the funds. And these funds will later on be rewarded to all these uh, players of the game who won. So any questions on this uh, how con this contract is done? Is it available online? I will uh, I will just upload to the same GitHub repo that you just downloaded from. Yeah. Questions? If not, that's the end of our workshop. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, oh yes, sorry. Uh, our marketing team will be here also, and uh, he will be talking to you guys about uh, what can be done on the Zilliqon blockchain and what can be done with the Scylla language. So let's welcome. <laughs> sorry, Bob. Hopefully by the time I'm done with the slides, we will be able to move on to the next one. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So we have heard uh, a lot today, we got an introduction to Scylla the language, and the question now becomes, how exactly can we move on from here? What are the next steps? Because what we have read today, what we have studied today, is basically a fraction of the entire space. If you are really trying to get into blockchain, it involves learning about distributed systems, learning about cryptography, learning about game theory, learning about, you can't see it here, but it is economics, learning about uh, regulation, and this one, it's etc. And etc. contains every single thing. If you're trying to build something for your medical application, then you'll have to learn about the medical field. If you're trying to learn something about, to uh, do something in the advertisement for blockchain, then you'll have to know specifically about advertisement blockchain, uh, advertisement industry per se. Etc. contains everything because blockchain, wherever there is trust involved or money involved, it will get into the picture. Now, there are two kind of reactions to this. One, people go, oh my goodness, this is way too much. Like, really, do I need to know all that in order to build something useful? And second, people go, wow, like, that sounds fun. If that isn't the reaction if you really want to continue on this one. Then there are several ways of getting the. Uh, I promise I'm not running my name on this computer, <laughs> but I'm just getting really so There are several ways of uh, going about it. And uh, we are more than happy to help you in any of the manner. There are a few ways you can interact. One is learning, second is walking, and third is building. If you really want to learn more about blockchain, then we are more than happy to help out. We do primarily two things. First of all, we conduct events. This is just one of the events that we have seen. There are more events like hackathons that we either organize or sponsor. So come join our channel, which is gitter.im slash Zilliqa. So Gitter is the GitHub's uh, uh, conversation channel. You can come join us there and uh, then if uh, you know more and more about our events, whether it is about hackathons or other such conversations, you'll get to see them. Alright, so this is a channel of ours. Uh, next hackathon of ours is going to be live from 7th to 9th of December. We are sponsoring it. Uh, it is uh, a general hackathon open and available for everyone. If you want uh, to work with Zeleka, uh, if you are a C++ developer, if you are a functional programmer, if uh, you enjoy doing full stack development, if you are a researcher or do you think you are an expert in any other field which might be relevant here, you are more than welcome to come and talk to us. Uh, send your CVs at kdsatsinica.com or you know, just uh, chat out with us. And uh, finally, if uh, you want to build something, if you have entrepreneurial ambitions, if you want to make something cool and interesting, if you think that whatever we talked about today is not sufficient, you have better ideas, sounds pretty interesting. Zilliqa has about 5 million US dollar of grant funding and grant funding means that we will not have any kind of stake in your company, 
he won't have any rights to whatever you're building. You will own it. It will be completely uh, your money, uh, based on, of course, like you deliver what you have promised to do. So, uh, this, so reach out to us to, if you have any idea in mind. If you want to build something, if you want to help us develop either Sala language. Uh, interpreters or any other such thing if you want to help us in developing the blockchain platform again reach out to us besides knowledge and seed capital what else can you provide to you if you were to build a company we can provide you access to venture capitalists we can introduce you to proper people in this channel whether it is exchanges or uh, peer agencies or other you know, such things if you want to do an ICO we have seen one of the crowdfunding examples here but perhaps you want to do a real one, in which case there are of course a lot many other loops to jump through. We can help you through that. Uh, we also have an option of direct funding if your idea is really unique and you think it's really crucial for the support of uh, Zilliqa's ecosystem, we'll be more than happy to do that. We can also provide you marketing support. So if you're building, let's say, a game, uh, or you're building some kind of a travel app which uses uh, blockchain to build, uh, to buy hotel bookings or something similar, whatever, we can help you with marketing support also. So we'll let more and more people know that, okay, this is something cool, you need to check it out. How do you take this conversation forward? Best way to approach for more details is, of course, again, through our video channel, uh approach us. And second best way, and perhaps more relevant right now, is uh, look at the people in the front seat. We need to feel free to reach out to us. There is food outside. <laughs> which we will be consuming along with you. You're more than welcome and have a conversation with us. Chat. Thank you.